I know it doesn't sound that exciting, but you're going to be shocked at what will come from this. Well, one day is Thursday, May 16th, 2024. This is the week in chart. I obviously want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So what are we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading and your favorite stock and crypto picks. Not seeing a whole lot going on in crypto, so we might have I don't have a lot to do this week, but we'll talk about it and see if we can find something. As far as the items of focus, I want to talk a little bit about a million little things. In fact, I actually want to start a series on this, and it has so much information I want to talk about. I just had a lot of, uh, it was hard picking and choosing what I wanted, but I want to kind of get the intro done first, and then I want to get into to that. And, and basically, it's not some major epiphany or a holy grail or whatever, that or magic bullet that's going to, make you a successful trader, but it is a million little things. And these things are, are easily attainable and easy to do. And a lot of them are free, obviously. I want to talk a little bit about what happens when you get a bit of a bear market countdown reset. And that'll make a lot more sense in just a few more minutes, in a few minutes, I should say. There's a swim screen as you know, you can lose money trading more off the summing up. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I borrowed that from my buddy, Greg Morris. All right, so last week and many weeks prior, I, I talk about performance-based technical analysis. Now, technical analysis can be all kinds of things, this huge gamut of all this stuff, and some of it's arcane and some of it's mumbo-jumbo, a lot of it's mumbo-jumbo. And these people give technical analysis a good, a bad name, good name, <laughs> a bad name. But the way I look at it is performance-based. And, and one thing I was explaining to somebody earlier today in the gym, and I was explaining to him, it's it's kind of like I've never ran a fantasy football, but imagine if I did ran a fantasy run a fantasy football team, I would pick the best players as opposed to picking the shittiest players. And the same thing goes for stocks and crypto and any other market. So along the lines of performance-based technical analysis, as long as the market is at or near new highs, you can't have a, mar a bear market. So you can't have a bear market when the market is making new highs. Now, if you take a look at the TFM 10% system zones, and if you look at the parameters over here, the screen is 100% of the 50 week closing high. So you can see we just closed at a brand new closing high. This next line down is 95% or 5% away, if you look at it that way, from the 50 week closing high. And that's a bit of a caution zone as Jeff from, one of my clients that's often in here pointed out that's an area where you might want to think about getting out of the way. Although the last two times the market survived that. And then once you get 10% or more away or 90% of the 50 week closing high, you might want to think about exiting, especially if you get a sell signal by the market closing also below the 50 week simple moving average. Now, no guarantees, obviously, and it is it is a free system, so I'll give you your money back for what you pay for the system. <laughs> but other than that, it can't help you much. However, it, it this simple little system would have kept you out of every bear market in history. Now, as I've said in prior weeks, I looked at it in more recent times when I, when I first did my analysis, so current, whatever the current market conditions were. I looked at it then and then went back a few years and then I hopped all the way back to the 20s to see what happened back then. And then obviously the last five years or however long I've created this system, however long ago and published it, I have paid attention to it going forward. And as I've mentioned quite a bit, the last signal we had, I bought the Qs at 319.49 and knock on wood, come in, uh, it's worked out pretty, pretty well so far. Now, the drawdown is going to be pretty tough if it goes all the way down to that 50-day, 50 50-week 50 simple moving average. But for now, it looks okay. Now, as I said last week, and somebody misconstrued it as I'm saying there's a bear market or a week before, whenever it was, the point I was making is that once you stop making new highs, it's almost like the countdown begins. Now, in that same presentation, the point I was making was not that we had topped, but to pay attention to what's happening, and you have time to get out of a bear market before the bear market begins. 
It doesn't feel like it sometimes, but if you go back and look at the charts historically, now there's been a few cases where it's only been three or four weeks, but for the most part, I think even in 1987, you had weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks where the market was topping, and then you received a TFM 10% system sell signal. So that's just one way of kind of looking at it is like, okay, if a market's topping out and we're going to count the sell signal as the official sell signal when the potential bear market has begun. Now, this isn't a great example back here because it was a whipsaw type of signal, but you can see it took one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 16 or 17 weeks before it actually triggered a sell signal. So the point I was making, especially if you go back and look at 2000, 2007, 1987, there was a few times in the 90s off the top of my head, I can't think about exactly when, but there was some pretty ugly spills in the 90s. And then obviously the 70s were just absolutely abysmal. I wasn't actually trading in the 70s, but I've done a lot of research going through the 70s. And as Bruce Frazier pointed out, even in the 70s, although everybody talks about how horrible and choppy the markets were, there was a pretty good trends back then. But before I digress too far, a simple little system, some sort of performance-based technique, something to get you out of trouble can work really, really well. And I'll show you something simple here in just one second to help keep you out of trouble too. I did a presentation, or actually I wrapped up a presentation recently about things that I wish I knew when I was just getting started trading. And one of, the, one of the things that came up was that it's not some grandiose epiphany where you wake up one day and that's it, I'm a trader. Okay, I got it all figured out. It's more of a million little things that you could do. And one thing that we'll get into in upcoming weeks is that our, as humans, this is actually a really good thing, okay? As humans, we are very resistant to change. Our bodies have this homeostasis. Think about your temperature, okay? Your temperature goes up five degrees or down five degrees, you're probably gonna die. So our bodies are used to try to keep things on even keel and fighting off drastic changes. And, and again, I'll get into the neurology of that and the psychology in upcoming webinars. And there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, people doing all these fad things now for dieting and all. and, and and I'll get into that too. But in, in most cases, these people end up much worse off than they were before, which is unfortunate. But don't expect some kind of huge epiphany to occur. It's a million little things that, that are going to make you. So there's no holy grail, as I preach week in and week out. But there's a lot of little things you could do, like follow that silly little TFM 10% system. I'm not saying put your life savings into it or whatever, but use that as one of your tools to keep you in or out of the market. So you're gonna have some minor epiphanies here and there. Just don't expect anything earth shattering. Now that's the bad news. So the good news is, again, there are a million little things you could do to become more and more successful. And we're just gonna scratch the surface tonight. I have a feeling that this series might go on for a while, I keep thinking of more and more of these things, and in some cases, forgetting to write them down. But they're gonna all come out over time, and I've got so many more that I've written about previously. In fact, I found an article or a topic, however you want to look at it, that's part of a book I'm working on called Trend of Thought, and this is where a lot of this thinking comes from. But anyway, I want to start with with documentation for this series and your morning pages, and we'll probably come back to that. So that's kind of the beginning. In the end, kind of to bookmark this whole series. And I can't say enough about these two things, but I want to kind of get into them a little bit tonight, and we could certainly flesh them out over time. But your documentation, your trading journal, that is, and your morning pages are going to be your two best friends as far as little things and, and painless little things. Now, obviously, in your trading journal, you want to document your trades. You also want to document with intent. And you want to imagine that you're going to show this journal to someone to explain what you did and why you did it. So make sure you put a lot of details into, into that. Now, obviously, you want to document the trading details, okay? 
but you also want to document your thought process and your fears, including FOMO, temptations, and emotions. And that's that's vitally important. And you want to seek to identify, embrace, and eliminate the extraneous, anything that has nothing to do with trading that's influencing you. And you're going to be surprised, actually shocked, especially if you do a lot of documentation as to how many things that have absolutely nothing to do with trading that are influencing you. Like I said a few weeks back, I had one of my biggest day, at least on an intraday basis, a few weeks back, one of the biggest days I can remember. And then the following day, I gave nearly all of it up because I walked into my office and I'm like, I'm Dave effing Landry, you know? <laughs> Laugh to keep from crying. But you wanna seek to identify, embrace, and, and embrace is key, okay? It's like, why am I feeling this way? Figure that out and eliminate the extraneous. And, and there's tons and tons of extraneous things. Now, the immediate extraneous should be should be fairly obvious. And that might be FOMO or a trade code. I, I talk with a lot of you guys, and sometimes I get caught up in, in what you're doing. And then I need to realize that I'm not you. You might have been doing this for a long time. You might know more about this particular market, being options or whatever. And maybe I just need to sit back and, and relax and watch and see what happens. So I am susceptible to trade goals. I have one client who's really good at scalping and day trading. And every now and then we'll be chatting back and forth in text and he'll tell me what markets he's trading. And I do find myself getting sucked in sometime. The good news is, is a little thing that I do, one of the million little things. And when that happens, I write his name and Bob, it's not his real name, but I'll just put Bob Gold. Like, why did I take this trade? Well, because Bob's taking it. It's like, which is stupid. I realize that. Okay. So I'm admitting guilt here. And I, and trust me, I don't, I don't do as many Bob Goads as I used to because through my morning pages, as I'll explain in one second, I realize that maybe I'm the definition of insanity. You know, by the way, one of the little things I want to add, I was just thinking a few minutes ago in the shower, is that at the end of the day, it doesn't have to be war and peace or huge write-up, but write what you did well today and write what you did poorly, okay? And then you can elaborate on those things tomorrow if you want in the morning pages. But your immediate extraneous should be fairly obvious what's influencing that trade that has nothing to do with the market. And your morning pages will reveal the possible longer term root cause. And maybe, maybe you're just really needing money. Like for instance, my wife's car I've been in the shop you know, three weeks. And it's like, every time we take it out, uh, we bring it right back because they still haven't fixed the problem. And then they ended up tearing off tearing into the whole engine it's just like it's just a it was a nightmare and you know every time she complains about that i kind of relive it and it's like okay well how do i make up that several thousand dollars could i go in and make some day trades well that's the worst thing you could ever do right but it's like I'm, at least i'm recognizing that extraneous is is influencing me and there's there's all kinds of little things too that your documentation is going to reveal i'll give you an example a, a a peer of mine, I guess that's what you'd call him. Uh, he's a trader guy. He's a public figure. He's really good at what he does. But he had a really bad week trading a while back, and he couldn't figure out what was wrong. And then I think it was Friday afternoon or Friday night. He had a beer when he got home or whatever. And he's like, oh, my God. I had He had made like a $40,000 payment, tuition payment for his son or something. And I think that that lack of money or that pouring of money out, however you want to look at it, really affected him. And he didn't even realize how bad that affected him throughout the week until Friday afternoon was a little too late. But going into the following week, he's like, okay, I'm not going to make 40 grand this week, but let me see if the market will come to me and maybe I can make back a little bit of that. But let's the, let the market again come to me. Anyway, morning pages, one of the best things I've ever done in my life. I tell everybody I see a shot from the rooftop that you should do morning pages. Nobody's gotten back to me. If anybody's doing morning pages, let me know. Leave me a comment. Let me know. I'd be very impressed if you were. Years ago, I did them, and I regret, I'm talking 30 years ago, 
I regret not following through. And I started them again at least maybe six or seven years ago. It's been a while. And it's it's one of the greatest things I've ever done as far as life is concerned and trading. And it's just wonderful. And I started back up after being reminded about them through Julia Cameron. Years ago, I called it a brain dump. Just get up and write everything in your head. Julia Cameron in her book, The Artist's Way, which I loaned out. So I don't know exactly everything she says, but I read like the first chapter and I haven't finished the book. But the first chapter talked about the morning pages. Now, she does some things that seem a little quirky to me, like create characters and all, like Doubting Dave and um, whatever, uh, you know, FOMO Fred or whatever you want to call them, different characters that they talk about that. To me, that's a, that's a little bit esoteric or kind of out there, but whatever works for you. But the bottom line is just wake up and write three handwritten pages. Now, what I would encourage you to do is to stay analog. And I started a book a while back. I haven't finished it yet uh, by Quick. It's called Limitless. And it's a pretty good book. The only My only dig so far, and that's probably why I'm a little slow to go through it, but the, the information is great. He does spend a little time telling you what he's going to tell you, which sort of, it's one of my little pet peeves when somebody spends too much time doing that. Hopefully I don't do that. At least I try not to in, in my writing. I just try to tell you. And let me know if I'm if I'm if I'm guilty of that. But anyway, uh, it's a book by Quick. It's limitless. I would recommend you read it. I do plan on finishing it. And but anyway, he talks about the the information deluge that we deal with, and it's very important to wake up and stay analog for a little while. It's good for your mental health because we're go 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 all day. My phone makes alerts all day long. I have no idea what they are half the time. So you got all these apps, all these programs, all this social media, it's just constantly going off and it's, it's just this barrage of information coming at you. And the bottom line is it's, it's very good for you to just kind of wake up and be quiet for a little while. So try to stay analog best you can, avoid X, Facebook, any social media, YouTube, emails, the TV, Markets, now I'm a little guilty there because I will check crypto, but I do and I do resist coming in here and turning on all my screens and looking at everything super early in the morning when I wake up. But basically you wanna avoid everything electronic unless you're using electronic notebook. And I use this Remarkable, which I absolutely love. And it's got thousands, literally thousands of handwritten pages in it. And we could talk about that uh, some more if you'd like, but it's it's a wonderful thing. One of the digs on it, which I think is actually a positive, is there's no there's no clock in here. There's no internet other than being able to upload to your email. There's only one way. So you're not, and I got ADD. I, or I have ADD, I guess, but the, the correct way of saying that. Uh, not diagnosed, but diagnosed by the wife, and, and she's probably right. Uh, one of my neighbors jokingly every now and then screams squirrel to see see if I look away. <laughs> but the bottom line is I actually like the fact that it's a very pure, it's almost like paper in a notebook other than you could convert to text and then upload your stuff to your email or however you want to get it into your computers. Anyway, I like it because of that, because it's just this pure analog thing. So try to avoid your electronics if at all possible other than your electronic notebook. Now, this is kind of a daunting task, and I get that, and it's a lot harder than you think it would be. It's not easy, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this, but write about anything, write about everything, and write about nothing, okay? You can write about your to-dos, what you have to do, and it, it's a great exercise in getting organized for the day. Write about your aggravations, your frustrations, your trials and tribulations. Are you tired? Are you rested? Did you stay up late watching some stupid whatever? Uh, or what, you know, did you get a good night's sleep? And if you don't know what to write about, write exactly that down. Geez, I don't know what to write about. And then maybe say, you know, if I didn't know what to write about, if I did know what to write about, this is what I would write. 
but obviously you want to talk a little bit at some point and, and and again there's no schedule here don't preload for instance i as i've said before i was telling someone about this and and he was studying to be a deacon and he's like oh yeah well i've got to do all this reading and i'm gonna do all my readings first when i first wake up because that's what i like to do them and then i'm gonna write about my readings it's like no that's that's not what it's about if you do your if you if you think about some of the readings you did the day before or whatever and you want to write a little bit about that that's fine but try not to preload with anything and ideally like in my case i should probably put my morning pages in the next page for tomorrow the night before because sometimes i will go through the notebook and i'm looking at notes and to do's and all this other stuff before you know it i am kind of off in three or four different directions imagine that but the bottom line is try not to preload just do them this is gonna this will change your life it's going to improve your trading i can't say enough good about them i know it doesn't sound that exciting but you're going to be shocked at what will come from this now keep in mind you're not writing war and peace don't judge yourself one thing i do because i know i'm if i'm spelling something wrong or whatever i just put sp in questions like did i spell that wrong or whatever and who cares nobody cares don't worry about grammar, don't worry about spelling, but your grammar and your spelling will get better over time by doing this, by the way. So again, you're not writing war and peace, don't judge yourself. And nobody is going to look at this other than you. I will say I did leave a notebook. <laughs> I did leave an open notebook, it was in my hand and I, I, would not, I wasn't doing my pages in the bathroom, but I left it in the bathroom once when we were at a rental house because everything was kind of just everywhere. When we were in the process of moving and i wasn't well i'm not organized now but i was even less organized then and my daughter happened to be visiting and she noticed the notebook she read a few things um that that got me a little trouble that involved her <laughs> but for the most part uh just make sure or, or in general just make sure nobody sees this this is your own private little deal and, and only share what you want shared obviously the hardest part is getting started in this and making it a habit in the first few days it, it it was really hard to start back up and it's like oh this is why i quit because it's so damn hard but now and i know you want to party with me but now the first thing i do when i wake up it, in fact it gets me out of bed I, like i'll lay in there going like oh, i gotta do this got to that it's like well, let me just get my writing done and see where we go from there so it's not easy getting started i find about midway through the half midway through the second page things start to click a little bit i might just write about a bunch of random stuff but then i actually might get something good about a page and a half or maybe two pages in but i don't i don't put that expectation on myself so don't don't say i'm gonna write about this and i'm gonna get this and do that if you want to do all that that's fine do your three pages first and you might find that that kind of warms you up for all that now it does take some time i don't time them i know it, it takes me a little while i write from probably well i get about 4:55 every day and i'm done writing about 6 30. now a lot of that might be working on a book or working on some writings for the week of charts or or for whatever or some thoughts on trading but for the most part you could probably get them done fairly quickly and, and just try to keep the pen and try to make it like flow there's a few things that i did that i'm thought about as i'm going live tonight is that there's a there's a psychology in doing this that's good for you in addition to the neurology for the for the warm-up for your day but there's a psychology and it's been seen in some cases i've seen psychologists talk about doing something like this as therapeutic and a form of meditation and it's virtually free although I, I i would buy cases of pen refills when i just had the uh before i had the, the tablet and then now i have to buy tips for the pens because i do wear those out every now and then but for the most part it's virtually free and again neurologically it's a great brain warm-up in the quick book he talks about that we consumed and are bombarded with more information in one day than people in this 15th century consumed in a lifetime and he talks about and this is another study he quoted talks about we consume more information or or we consume 
three times the amount of the information as we did in the 60s. I would say it's more like 30 times the amount. So I, I found that number a little low, but but it is amazing. And I think I've heard some studies going back like 100 years and just the amount of information that we take in in one day would take a year to to have that much information years and years ago. And if you think about all the things that are going on, and I'm guilty as anyone. I mean, I've got these six screens or seven screens, or however many screens going on. And I'm obviously, the market's pulling me in these different directions. I'm getting alerts on different things. I'm going to social media alerts and all. And you got to really learn how to manage that. And I, I need to be better about that. But it, it's a nice, quiet, gentle introduction to the day's deluge of information overload ahead. Now, it will unearth some deep-seated issues which could be good and bad. And the good thing is you'll quickly identify, especially as it's as it relates to trading, if you become Einstein's, have become Einstein's definition of insanity, and that's doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. Now, again, you wanna keep those expectations low. I go in with zero expectations, and a lot of times I'm pleasantly surprised, sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I'm kind of like uh, really into, like lately I've been, building a dining room table and I'm beginning, uh, I've, I've gotten heavily back into woodworking lately. So sometimes I'll find myself writing a lot about woodworking. Obviously I, I write a lot about trading and then I write about what's going on in life too. Now getting back to the million little things and, and, and again, I'm gonna flesh a lot of these things out, I promise over the next few weeks. But as a general rule, if we wanna go to like technical analysis, million little things, do not buy a market that is trading below the 30 EMA. So we take a look at the P's and here's the spiders, but you can see that we had a really good run for a long time above the 30 EMA. And then the market got a little bit questionable. Now, if you go back throughout history, you'll see that you had bear markets obviously below that 30 EMA. And a lot of times that in and of itself, just not buying a market unless it's above the 30 will keep you out of a lot of trouble. Now, I'm not saying you want to blindly buy a market. Like, okay, we'll buy the 30 back here, although it would have worked nicely, but it, you know, let's rush out and buy the market. No, but you might want to wait to see if a trend develops in a pullback, ideally, if you're trading pullbacks. And Landry Light pullbacks, a great thing to do. That's just looking for this Landry Light like this. You're looking for a pullback to the to the EMA, maybe something like that, and then looking to rally when it, when it rallies off of it. But again, that'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. And the more I look at the 30 EMA through a variety of markets, the more impressed I am with how it could really help to keep you in the right side of the market. And just randomly, I grabbed whatever that last one was, the P's, and then I grabbed Ethereum, and we had a really good run in Ethereum. And this technically, I guess this is a Landry Life pullback, but it didn't materialize. But you could have stopped out a small loss, but then you could see for a long time, Ethereum has really been underperforming. So you would want to avoid that market. And if you start looking at some of these shit coins, SHYT, you'll see a lot of cases, these things might half or lose 80 or even 90% of their value and never touch, even touch that 30 EMA. Is one I grab, grab randomly, Cardano, ADA, ADA. You can see for a long time, it's been below that 30 EMA. This is what, 65 up here. So that's about a 40 or 50% drop down to the lows that would have been avoided. Just something as simple as that. And so it's a million little things will make you successful. And if you go back, if you can't sleep at night, and as Craig Morris jokes, not about my stuff, but about his, being self-deprecating, but it's a good little joke. It's like uh, don't operate heavy machinery afterwards. But if you go back in the day, especially before the Facebook group, the Facebook group sort of took, uh, sort of eliminated the stock analysis because somebody will just bring up the stock at Facebook and we'll talk about it there. But before the Facebook group, I used to get asked about dozens of stocks in these presentations. And feel free to ask about all you want, and I'll be happy to look at them. It's just that it's gone down since we started the Facebook group. But anyway, you're going to be shocked. Go back and look at all those setups that we asked about that I didn't like, 
And I'd be willing to bet that 99% of them were below the 30 EMA. I had some other blatant problem that you could deduce through one of these million little things. So I know I'm just kind of scratching the surface here. As you can tell, I'm not organized just yet. And I've got so many things I want to just kind of cram into it. So I need to, we'll take a uh, step back next week. We'll look at like the Kaizen way of doing things. The Kaizen way is just small little incremental changes and to kind of fight that homeostasis. If you get bored between now and then, I've got Trick and Train Your Brain. Uh, search my website for acrasia. Uh, there's some, some good stuff by James Clear about that on the website, davelander.com. And the YouTube channel is at Dave Landry. Tons and tons of stuff there. But Trick and Train Your Brain is one that comes to mind. I need to find those slides and incorporate them in soon. And there's a lot of stuff that's already out there that, that are kind of dovetail in with these million little things. Hey, you liking this video? Then like this video. If you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. I'm half kidding. Also, subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, and I thank you for that. And I got my first, out of the blue, this came in. I got my first super thanks. So thank you. I really, it's nice to be appreciated. So uh, shout out to Jim Russell. 514, not to be confused with Jim Russell 513. <laughs> uh, but thank you, Jim, so much. All kidding aside, I appreciate I appreciate that. He says, I appreciate great work. The core methodology definitely the way to profit in the current ADHD market. And I think that was right before the market began to take off and make new highs. Okay, let's see. I'm off to the office. Looking forward to catch the rest of the week's charts later tonight. Matt from Australia. Thank you, Matt. We're getting a lot of people from down under joining. That's cool. Hey, Dave, basic question. You still trail your stop one to one before the IPT is hit or use more judgment and trail that more loosely initially to give it room. Thanks. Keep up the good work. Okay, that's Mike C. All right. My, hey, Mike, I hadn't seen you in a while. Um, yeah, let's, in fact, let's, let me show you that real quick. Let's, let's address that question and then we'll hop into the overall market. So we're along SVM. And I don't know exactly where the stop is. Let's let me get this changed over. Then we'll jump into crypto. But this one, uh, we're long from. Anybody know where we're long from? Let me see if I can get a spreadsheet up really quick. So the the question is is how do I trail the stop on the first low? So what I used to do is is almost a pure one for one basis so we're in svm from 350 okay and our stop is at three now so i used to trail on a one for one basis so 350 is right so it looks like it triggered on this day here and i used to if it goes up a penny i trail my stop a penny on the first low okay and i'll explain the lows here in one second for those who don't know but now I'm a little bit more lenient. It's still close to one-to-one, -to -one, but I do give them a little bit of room here and there. And if you look at where the stop is based on how much this has rallied from where we entered, you'll see that that's a little bit looser than the one-for-one -one basis on the trailing stop. And by the way, if you want to go in and look at some of those, again, this is one of those can't sleep at night things, but I think it's a it's an extremely valuable thing you can do, and it's also 100% free. Go to davelearner.com slash archives and see what I recommended, see how I applied the money management, and see how it worked out, warts and all, and you'll see that in more recent years, I'm a little bit more lenient with that first low. Now, just real quick, and then we'll get to crypto and come back to stocks and in, in the overall market. But we're also long this one from way back here. And the once you hit the initial profit target, which was in here somewhere, then your your stop is at break even, okay? And I forget, let me see what's what was the original risk on this. So the original risk on this, and it sounds a little crazy, but it's only 15%, was 6.7 points, okay? And now the stop is much, much, much wider than that. So once you hit the initial profit target, you bring your stop up to break even, okay? You exit half of your shares at the initial profit target without going into a complete money management lesson. There's plenty of lessons out there already that I've talked about this. And then 
that's when we let the stock gradually loosen up. And we're trying to gradually make that transition from the short-term trader with the fairly tight stops to, to survive, you know, stops that can survive the short-term zigs and zags in the market to more of a longer-term stop to where we could ride out these trends for hopefully weeks, months, and years. And so we've been in this thing since last July, I believe. And so that's that's been a pretty good run. It would be great to make at least one year in this stock. People say, Dave, what's your holding period? And I always say 10 years, hopefully much longer. When I get into stock, I want to be in it forever. Obviously, the money management takes me out much, much sooner. But yeah, Mike, uh, on that first loaf, we are, it's, it's in general, it's a one-to-one -one stair step. But in more recent years, I have given them a little bit more wiggle room, on, you know, a small amount of more wiggle room, you know, maybe like keep the change type of goes up a few cents. I don't bother moving it up or if maybe it jumps a point, I might only move it 75 cents or something like that, depending on the, on the movement in the stock. But I will let that open up a little. And that's that's helped us to stay with some winners a little bit longer. Years ago, I don't know. I lose track of everybody. And I wish I would write down who's doing what. But you know, And I will. I'll try to get better. But somebody years ago would not adjust their stop until the initial profit target was hit. I guarantee you he was catching more winners than I was. But I also guarantee you that he was losing more on the losing trade because he didn't have that stop trailing up. So I'm not sure how it worked out net net, but as I preach with a methodology like mine, it requires an outlier. Anything you could do to catch more outliers as a general statement, provided you're not throwing caution to the wind, is probably a good thing. And sometimes you'll get these markets that kind of go up and come right back in, sort of like this one did. And then you're able to, if you're not bumping that stop too tight, you're able to ride out those little corrections before you hit the profit target and before you change your hat from short-term trader, swing trader, to longer-term trader. So hopefully that answers the question. I know it was a long-winded answer, but thank you, Mike, for that question. I haven't heard from you in a while. How have you been? Okay, um, let's take a look at crypto, and then we'll pop out to the overall market. Now, if there's any pairs you want me to look at in crypto, let me know. There's not a whole lot of action in crypto, although I did see one early. I was long this one. I got knocked out, and I was a little upset tonight. And this, and, you know, here's a million little things, right? And, and this is going to make me a better trader too. So selfishly, I'm doing these these this series, but I should be long this this pair. This actually looks pretty good. You had a nice little pullback. And I was long this one last week, if memory serves, but I haven't done a whole lot in crypto lately. Let's take a look at Bitcoin. You can see Bitcoin now back above the 30. That's not a rush out and buy Bitcoin, but as you can see, that, that 30 is your best friend. Look at this. Look at this from here. Let's just say 44,000 roundish numbers all the way down to... 17 okay so that's that's over that's about 60 percent just kind of doing some math in my head 60 percent drop you would have avoided just by not buying it when it's below the 30 ema i'm not saying buy it when it rises above it maybe use something like landry live pullbacks you know wait for that pullback to the ema and then buy it but you certainly can stay out of a lot of trouble by not buying markets, any markets, as long as they're below the 30. And you can see it stayed below the 30 here for a long, long time. Now it's back above. I'm not saying, again, rush out and buy it, but it's certainly better to buy markets that are above the 30, like back here. You can see nice little run there. What was that? 38,000. That's a, that's a double, okay? Pretty much round numbers, almost a double. So... You're much better off buying a market that's well above the 30 than by trying to buy a market that's below the 30. And look at this initial drop here. You were up at 61,000 and then it dropped down without even getting above the moving average for the most part to 30,000. So there's a 50% haircut right there. By the way, I was explaining this to a friend at the gym this morning. And you probably know this, I'm sure, but in case you don't. Every asset class will lose half of its value at some point in your lifetime. 
So that's why I wrote an article a while back called Cash is Not Trash and They Are No Good Long-Term Investments. But Dave, you said you want to stay with stock 10 years. Well, I'm a trend follower. If that stock goes up for 10 years, I'm going to stick with it with a trailing stock. Anyway, I don't think there's a lot to talk about in crypto at the moment. Crypto heats up and cools off. And, you know, it's another one of those many little things. When crypto cools off, look at this. Look at that 50. Okay, look at that. Look at this. I mean, 30. Look at that 30. Yeah, man, it's huge. Okay. Would have kept you out of a lot of trouble. One little close above it for the most part. This thing with 35, again, half. Okay, it lost half its value. Anyway, uh, I lost my train of thought here. But you can see, here's another one, look, below the 30, okay? So all I'm doing here is I'm just sorting by the strongest. Oh, I know what I want to say. A million little things, okay? I missed that ABT trade. I, I was doing my analysis tonight right before I went live, and I'm like, holy crap, I missed that trade. Had I just taken two minutes, not even two minutes, okay, to go through these pairs, I would have had another IPT hit, and I'd be free rolling in another pair. So that's a little bit frustrating, but I'm learning too, right? Uh, what's the uh, Acora, Empora, whatever? Michelangelo said when he was 80 years old, I am still learning, right? And that's really the attitude to take. You can't, you you know, again, you're not going to wake up one day and you're just this perfect trader. It's it's a lot of work, okay? I probably would sell a lot more in my educational business if I made it look a lot more exciting. <laughs> but it's not. It's a lot of work. And there's no magic. There's no magic. There's no secrets, okay? It's just paying attention to markets, buying stronger markets, selling weaker markets, avoiding markets that are what? Below the 30 EMA. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. That's huge. Okay. Never got above that 30. And again, let's see. It was above the 30, dropped below 81. That's another half in value. Okay. All right. Any pairs you guys want to look at before we jump into stocks? Any stocks you want to look at, let me know. Now we'll take a look at the overall market and then we'll take a look at your stock picks if we have any. By the way, if you're watching uh, the recording of this, you want to join us live, DaveLanner.com slash webinar, or just pay attention to my YouTube channel and I'll make announcements or I'll put the um, live schedule up. Usually it's Thursdays at 6 Central, 7 eastern unless it's a holiday week or there's something that's stopping me from doing the webinar all right sp 500 all-time highs today earlier today and, and yesterday obviously we closed at all-time highs yesterday that's a good thing as a trend following moron i am not going to argue with all-time highs now there's always something to worry about and before we get to that sometimes you have a big, huge up day like we had yesterday, and then you have a bit of a pause day, and then you have nice follow through to the upside. I've seen some people with some short term systems based on that. I, I can't, I can't recommend, or I would not recommend. It's just my own opinion, obviously, but I wouldn't recommend you rush out and trade such systems. But there does seem to be some merit in that, and it is definitely a reoccurring pattern. Now, with that said, maybe today was just a pause day. I, I kind of hate to see the market stalling out right after making brand new highs like it did, the little sell-off late in the day. So we'll have to see. Now, as far as something to worry about, sometimes you'll get a double top where the market will overshoot the prior top and then come right back in. Very rarely does a market go up to its prior highs perfectly and then roll back over for a perfect double top. Usually, as I preach, it'll do two things. One, it'll overshoot that level and then come back in, or two, it'll stall short of that level and then roll over. Both of those psychologically cause the market to sell off fairly hard. Again, rarely is it kind of textbook where it makes this perfect little double top. But anyway, let's not worry about that just yet. If we do come below, back below, let's just say 52.45, 52.50, somewhere in there, then eh, I might pull in my horns a little bit. The other thing to worry about, and again, there's always something to worry about, is we're very overbought in here, a little bit longer term. We had a pretty good run. What's that run? Let's see, that's uh, about a seven or 8% run. I mean, sometimes the market only goes, well, sometimes it goes down, obviously, but sometimes a market only goes seven or 8% in a year, and, and low double digits 
if you think about it, that's that's probably an okay year for stocks. Anyways, take a look at NASDAQ. Bam, winning yesterday. It hit all-time highs. Today came back in a little bit more. Of course, it's, um, I guess, percentage-wise, it's the same as the P's. But this looks a little bit more like a pause day than the P's. But again, everything I just said about the P's applies to the NASDAQ. The Q's, which I'm still long, the Q's triggered at 319, way back here, the TFM temperature system. We're, we're running ahead of time tonight. So let me see if I can pull that up real quick and show you with the Q's. When I say we, it's just me. Um, I went long the Q's just kind of for S and G's, and I never. I never dreamed in a million years I'd run this for 25, 30% over the period of time. So let me just show you real quick. We'll hop over here. Yeah, keep the stock picks coming. We'll give them just, just a few more minutes and I wanna get through the market and we'll get there. So look, I'm gonna put the zones in here. And if you have, if you have ACP, I can't help you with your subscription, but if you have ACP right now, my plugin is free and eventually I might charge for it. And I've been saying that for three years, but I would recommend you get it now just in case. <laughs> and to get it, uh, like this video, of course, you watch it on YouTube and then click down here, which is plugins. And again, my plugin is free. I have one of the most popular plugins, second most popular plugin, I think, on stockcharts.com. I guess it helps that it's not, I'm not charging for it. But anyway, I could click share to anyone here tonight. In fact, you can just use this link if you want. And uh, if, if interested, I'll be happy to put in my comments below on uh, YouTube. But if you have ACP and you copy this link, you might have to load the plugin first. But if you copy this link, you can get this exact chart like I made it here. Okay, I used some zones for the for these parameters here. Again, uh, this is 100%, the 50-week. This is minus 5, and this is minus 10. So the sell signal for this would be down here at 396, which is looking a lot better than it was. And when it was uh, at, in the, you know, pushing 400 and it's down in 350, that had me a little nervous. Uh, it's gonna suck giving up 50 points, but it's not as bad as it was back here. But uh, long from 319.49, but who's counting right here? So you had bar one above the 50 simple and then bar two above the 50 simple. And you go long on the close on Friday. It's a weekly system. When you have those two bars of Landry light, meaning the lows are greater than the moving average, 50 week moving average, okay? And then you exit when you close below the moving average and also 10% or more away from the 50 week closing high. And that's the entire system right there. It's hard to believe it's that simple. But anyway, so far so good in the queues. You can see it on a weekly basis right here at all time highs. Let's take a look at the P's and it, it, this is gonna help you see the forest for the trees a little bit. Now, everything I just said about possible double top and all that, there's always something to worry about. Let's not worry about that until the time comes. In fact, as long as you're within this 5% zone, the green zone here, I wouldn't get too nervous about the market when you dip into this pink zone. As Jeff pointed out, the 5% zone, that's when you needed to possibly think about taking some action. And by the way, when I say take action, okay, the overall market, I usually don't trade the overall market like this. I just trade individual stocks. But again, I took the trade for S&Gs and it's turned out to be one of the better things I've done. <laughs> I was in a gym today thinking, and I was explaining stocks and stuff to this buddy of mine. And it's like, after he left, I'm like, I'm thinking like, maybe there is something to trade in those ETFs. Because I'm always saying that your inefficiency is going to be in individual issues. And I still believe that firmly in your stock picking. Like for instance, CGC, of course it didn't follow through, but it went up 77% a few days ago. Luckily we were long, but we got stopped out after we took some profits. But anyway, your, your big money is going to be in the inefficiency of individual issues, but you can see when you have a pretty good run in a market, like the Qs, we just, we're looking at 25, 30%, that could pay off nicely too, but that doesn't happen nearly as often, obviously, as it does if you're seeking out inefficiency in individual issues. All right, let's get back to stock market analysis. Anyway, Q's just off of all time highs, a little bit of a pause day there today. I hate to use the word hope, but let's hope it was just a pause day. Let's take a look at the rusty, rusty 2000, bit of a bummer, stalling out. Uh, 
it's been wide and loose and sideways and toppy looking forever. And I was hoping, I know you should never hope in markets, but I was hoping it would clear this, this little peak right here, which it almost did yesterday. But now it's come back in a bit. And the problem is the top of this trading range is the bottom of this big fat overhead supply, big fat trading range above it. Okay, overhead supply, overhead resistance, however you want to look at it. And it's just simple technical analysis 101. Anyone who bought this market back here is going to be inclined to get out at break even. Now, the good news is it's been a while, it's been a couple of years since that's happened, this trading range. So some people have likely gotten out since then, okay? But keep in mind that markets, people say, well, Dave, how long do I have to worry about overhead supply? Well, technically forever, because markets have real long, long memories. But keep in mind that people get divorced. Unfortunately, some people die and their states get settled. And a lot of things happen, tax law selling and stuff like that over a period of time. And it does help to, to, to um, what's a good word for it, the, for, to walk that out of the system or to have that slowly come out of the system but always pay attention even if it's a long time in the past because it's nothing to take lightly okay but the further back in time yeah unless you have to worry about it but you still have to worry about it anyway let's take a look at a few more areas in here gold the commodity doing pretty darn good you know these guys on the radio finally are right <laughs> god the commercial i heard about six months ago if you're like me you don't want to lose 30 percent of your value of your of your money again like in stocks is like well hang on a second gold loses half of its value every now and then i don't know if this would be the best chart for it let's take a look at the monthly chart and see if there's anything we can glean yeah so gold was on this chart whatever 152 and it went down to what longer term charts is much more scarier so it lost at least 50 60 percent of its value back there so yeah, you don't want to lose 30% of your money, put it in gold. Well, you can lose 50% of your money or more. So stupid. But anyway, it's like, okay, so they're finally right. These gold guys on radio, well, why are they selling it to you? Okay, if it's going to double or triple. But that's another conversation altogether, I suppose. Anyway, gold off a little today, but so far it's rallied out of a pullback fairly nicely. Gold stocks look at okay too. We're long, again, SVM. We'll take a look at silver, but you can see gold stocks just off a of multi your highs in here, silver, the commodity, looking okay, uh, kind of a pause day today, but so far so good, a little overbought, but so far rallying nicely out of that pullback. We're not long into gold stocks just yet. The gold stocks, well, silver too, but gold stocks and silver can be quite choppy and there hasn't been a whole lot of clean setups in those areas. And that's why we're not long as many, but if this market keeps trending, we should find more and more setups most areas are looking pretty good in here there's infrastructure you see pull back a little today like everything else so far it's broken out the new highs so far just pulling back not everything's great in the world if you take a look at the transports you can see they look a little questionable a little bit of a downtrend here followed by a pullback but again most areas looking pretty good there's defense all the wars in the world finally beginning to work uh for defense somebody emailed me back here a long lost relative and they wanted to buy and this thing was just imploding at the time they wanted to buy defense stocks because of the ukraine war or whatever other war was happening at the time the war de jour and i said wait until it goes up before you buy it i'm not sure what he did but i'll get a call from him every now and then here his wife it's like um you know, after uh, COVID, they wanted to buy airlines, and it's like, no, don't don't buy them until they start going up. Don't don't buy airlines anyway. <laughs> the best way to trade airlines is wait till they go up and then short them. But anyway, most areas are looking pretty good in here. Let's take a look at the semiconductors. Let's look at pharmaceuticals first. Drugs have really come back with a vengeance, but my only concern here is they've come all the way back. And now they're bumping up against their old highs, okay? So I wouldn't be too excited about drugs at this juncture. That's a little bit concerning, but let's just take things one day at a time. Let's take a look at the semiconductors. Semiconductors, a little stalling action today, but we did plow through this overhead supply like butter. My big concern about markets that have these V-shaped recoveries at high levels 
as I preach, is by the time you get all the way back to the old highs, you're already overbought and it's hard to build the leg on another leg or the prior leg. And the peas have that kind of action happening too. You can see they made a pretty serious leg higher and they're overbought, as I said a second ago. So there's, there's always something to worry about, but for now, let's give the market the benefits of the doubt. Let's, there's any other sectors you guys and girls want to look at. I think that's pretty much it. Home builders stalling out. I think I'm right, but early here, by the way. We are, we're short, KBH, and got stopped out. And maybe I'll talk about that one next week as part of the million little things. But you can see home builders got whacked pretty hard. And here's that example of by the time you get all the way back to the old highs, the market is already overbought. Kind of a dangerous area, obviously, to buy into. Let it break out to new highs, see if it can stick, and then maybe look to trade that first pullback afterwards. Financials made it back to new highs. Again, possibly a little overbought in here. Probe new highs today, came back in to close in Flatsville. Let's give them the benefit for the doubt now. I'm not seeing a lot of setups, by the way, and that's because the methodology requires a pullback. So the it's kind of self-regulating sometimes where we're not buying into this overbought. We're going to wait until the market becomes a little less overbought, not by waiting for the market to become less overbought, but for either a rolling correction through the sectors or just setups in general. But right now, because we're not seeing a whole lot of setups, I think we have one long possible in the Landry list going in tomorrow and the rest are shorts. Not that I wanna go out and short, there's no recommendations for tomorrow. That's what I'm telling my clients. But right now, the for the methodology to get some setups, we're, we're going to have to have a pullback. Okay, I think that's enough market analysis if there's anything you want me to look at again, let me know. Keith wants to take a look at ASPN, and I'll check in with YouTube here in just one second if you guys are waiting on me. Um, there's one thing, for, you know, let's forget about longer term for a second. In a trend, let me just, uh, KNF, let me back this out a little bit. In a trend, I like to see, this is an IPO, so this might be a bad example. Let's see. What would be another good example? Let me take a look at like TARS, okay? We're long TARS, T-A-R-S, okay? And we got long in this pullback, but notice this Notice this trend, okay? Notice it was moving higher and then it accelerated higher, okay? And notice there's a lot of days in this trend. This set, This tells me that there's a lot of people interested in this. And then it kind of blew off a little bit and then came right back in. So it's like, okay, this sucked in a few people and then it shook them out. But the point I'm trying to make is if you're looking for a trend, you want to make sure it's more than one bar. So we take a look at that ASPN. Your whole trend is kind of one bar. So you want markets to be accelerating, not decelerating. So this thing went straight up, okay? And then now it's kind of doing this. So you have this, you have kind of like, that action happening. So I would leave that alone. Uh, this pullback was too deep back here, but notice the trend back here, how it accelerated higher. That's the kind of trend you wanna look for, Keith. You don't wanna see these one and done type bars. This is kind of hard to sustain. It's like you get all excited about a market that just goes straight up, especially if you're long. But in general, it's hard for that market to sustain itself. So I would avoid that. There's a lot of stocks that are trending right now, not set up. So I, would, I wouldn't have this one per se on my momentum list, but there's plenty of other stocks out there. Believe me, with the overall market as a general statement headed higher and in a, in a serious uptrend. Okay, any more? Well, while we're in impasse, well, let me check on YouTube, sorry. Hey, Dave, a member of your service. Well, thank you, HW. What do you think it's this ticker symbol rig dollar sign rig okay that's going to probably be oil field related is that is that just rig or a g transocean okay so i'm assuming you talk about transocean which is going to be oil field related let's take a look at the oil stocks real quick in general let's see where we are there and oil in general has made a comeback but Let's see if I can find it. 
talk about yourself. It's actually a market I meant to mention earlier. What's um, XME? What's a good oil fuel uh, ticker? XLF. It's down here somewhere. These things are hard to. Oh, XLE. Okay. So energies are looking a little bit better, but you can see that they're kind of consolidating and and trading off a little bit. I wouldn't say they're in trouble, but they've certainly lost some momentum. And then compare that to the overall market, which just banged out all time highs. So energies don't look horrible, but I'm not super excited about rushing out and buying the energies at this juncture. Now, with that said, let's take a look at rig. You can see there's really nothing for me here, okay? Because this thing kind of ran up and then it retraced nearly all of what it ran up and now it's kind of running up again. Is it going up? Is it going down? I don't know, okay? You want to look for something that's in more of a of a solid trend if that's the one you're talking about okay so yeah i would pass on on that one uh just for s and g's let's throw that 30 in there and see if that would keep you out of any trouble 30. well it looks like well hang on let's get an exponential in there okay yeah really nothing to glean with the 30 ema because we are technically above it. I was kind of hoping we'd still be below it so I could just say, well, look, it's below 30. Look how long it stayed below 30 back here. So, and then again, just because it pops above it doesn't mean you want to buy it. You're still in a downtrend, draw your big blue arrows. So yeah, this thing still looks kind of ugly to me. It's kind of all over the place. And I know energy stocks could be all over the place, but yeah, I would leave that one alone. Oh, you're welcome, anytime. All right, thank you, Raphael. Raphael says, great job. Okay. It looks like we got all the questions answered. Okay, any more? USO? Yeah, USO, that's a dollar, right? Or is that oil? Yeah, that's going to be, is that, that's actually physical oil, right? Now, looking at this, you can see it did, you know, bigger picture wise. I don't trade off a bigger picture technical analysis, but I do use it in my analysis, okay? But you can see that this thing kind of made a double top. This is the actual commodity or commodity related. It's it's tied to the commodity. And you can see that, hey, where are we? Look at this 30, okay? Look at that 30, it's huge, right? We're below the 30. So that's kind of looking ugly. I bet if we put a bow tie in that. Yeah, you can see this is bow tie to the downside off of fairly major highs. So we got a bow tie to the downside, a little bit of a pullback, the bow tie triggered here. So I wouldn't rush out and short it, but it looks like a short. If it bow ties up, okay, the way I feel about commodities, Jeff, is if you're gonna use something like a bow tie with commodities, you wanna try to find those bow ties at low levels, like back here. Somebody was talking about like Siri, for instance. I would avoid Siri. That's it sounds like that's becoming a meme stock. But notice how it is kind of bottoming out and going sideways. So this thing bottoms out for months and months and months at all time lows and then bow ties up. That might be worthwhile. OK. Oh, talking versus rig. OK, good point, Jeff. Thanks for bringing that up. OK, so Jeff wouldn't say wouldn't say and rush out and buy rig. He was saying take a look at USO and USO is below the 50 simple moving average of 30 exponential moving average is bow tied down. As I just said, both in downtrend proper order and in a setup to the downside for the bow ties. So, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Okay. USO looks better chart wise. Okay. If it bow ties up. But yeah, wait for the bow tie. Um, ideally, especially commodities, you want that bow tie coming off of major, major, major highs or major, major, major lows. Somebody was asking me in Twitter or I guess X now about a stock. And uh, I think it was NVIDIA. They were saying, hey, Dave, this thing bow tied up. Should I buy? I'm like, no, you want to you wanna find a bow tie coming off of all-time highs for shorts or major, 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 major lows for longs. Okay. All right, I think that's it. And uh, we're going once, going twice. Well, obviously, I want to thank everybody for attending tonight. Appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered, you know the routine, david, dave, Landry.com. Everybody have a great night, and may the trend be with you. Thank you so much.